task today, our agenda today, is quite ambitious. It includes uh, the general title, Visions of the 21st Century. And it consists of four, well, five parts. Um, four parts for the, as it were, the lecture part of it. Um, there's going to be time for feedback, uh, sorry, uh, your questions and answers or contributions and so on. Um, I'm going to make time for that. So I'm going to be quite quick skipping around my, my parts, which, as you know, couldn't, can go on forever, and um, I have to spend a great deal of time shortening them. The, uh, in the interval, there will be the half 25-minute video with Groff um, taking us through the perinatal process. It's quite profound, and indeed, there's a whole video after that, and, and there's a, that, he, the video he was giving that 25 minutes as an extract, which, if any of you are really, really keen, we could find a way for that to be shown um, also. Um, since I, I, I get, once again, I, I pay, I'm fully paid up member of that course, and I think uh, they would like it if I, if I spread the word, so to speak, by giving certain extracts from it. Be okay, but perhaps not the whole thing, you know. So that's our program. Um, in, uh, the interval has the video, um, the two parts before the program, uh, the interval, the expanding fields of knowledge. I want a quick look at the fields of knowledge that are in the 21st century expanding in front of us. Um, and the crisis of civilization and responding visions before the break. After the break and after the video, look at the new metaphysics and hi, and uh, new metaphysics and the integrated vision of human consciousness. The uh, as some ultimate uh, aim that's possible for human beings. The expanding field of knowledge. Okay, think of the parable of the five blind men, the famous Hindu parable, and the elephant. Think of the elephant as some symbol. It could be a symbol of the self. Jungians often interpret it that way. For the Hindus, it would be a symbol of Brahman, um, of the um, field of knowledge, perhaps we could think of it. Um, some huge area which we blindly touch some part of and try and figure out what it is. It's a useful parable because, as we know, the, from psychology and from philosophy, the world of our consciousness is, in some sense, blind. It's some, it only has limited access to the r real, so-called real world, doesn't it? It's a limited antenna. It, even our senses are limited, and our senses are major feeders for the brain. And so, therefore, the idea that somehow we're touching different parts of a vast field um, is a parable that's made sense across the ages. Um, we will think of the fields of knowledge that are in front of us as I was going over half a dozen or a dozen of them in the last week or two. I tried to think of what they, it felt like to be looking at these fields of knowledge like history and economics and physics and chemistry and life sciences and systems theory and the list went on um, and the things we've looked at and indeed many, th many of these things are covered in that wonderful book Systems View of Life by Capra which covers so many disciplines it's just amazing what he's done the, and it, it seemed to me they were like fractals or kaleidoscopes and uh, uh, some changing um, multiplicitous system and uh, which somehow just went on forever and indeed that is how I uh, phrased it in the sower and the seed in the opening chapter where I so it's only four or five paragraphs opening chapter and the last paragraph basically is about some telescope which is our consciousness uh, pointed to the starry sky, uh, to an, a universe which is always expanding beyond our range. So this is like also a symbol for our knowledge system, our consciousness, which is looking at an expanding world of knowledge, an expanding universe, which is indeed not just expanding but accelerating, isn't it? But that's like knowledge. Knowledge is accelerating. And, um, and it, it, it's infinite. It's not that we're going to find uh, the, the, the ultimate theory of everything. The, these are nice words to hear and sell a lot of books. But in fact, we, all, we do, all we come up against is an edge of a, a more mystery. 
And if you think of physics, that's been totally the case, the astounding discoveries of physics. But then come up against the enormous mystery of string theory and black holes and so on. We've just gone into other universes, and other dimensions, and other cosmi and, um, and, and forces that we scarcely can comprehend. And that's been the result of you know, 150 years of advanced physics making tremendous progress. So it seems as if our telescope, our consciousness, looks out into the cosmos to, an, to, to something which is always expanding ultimately beyond us, no matter what, no, what advances we make. And that uh, we always see some reflection somehow of ourselves, that consciousness is, is, is seeing itself. We're looking at the Big Bang, or we're looking at the supposed Big Bang, or we're looking at the origins of things, we, we push back to the origins. But ultimately, we're looking, consciousness is looking at itself, or looking at its creator, or looking at some vast intelligence which it is part of, or co-creationist with. And so therefore, it, 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 it requires not just knowledge and seeing things outside of one, but looking inside of one and uniting the contemplative disciplines, the inner knowledge, with what is going on outside in, in terms of our knowledge systems. To get some quick uh, hold upon these knowledge systems, you might think of them as being powered or fueled by various methods. The first method, of course, is the scientific method, which has been around since the, the Western Enlightenment. Enlightenment is a double-edged word. In the West, it means the scientific enlightenment of knowledge beginning with the 16th, 17th century. And in the East, of course, enlightenment is an inner state of vast intuition and integration and is ultimately a spiritual state. So very different views of enlightenment. The scientific method which emerged from the Western Enlightenment is a certain set of um, principles, philosophy, which underlies all of the knowledge virtually that has been gained. That is, it uses the scientific method. I'll just call that SM, scientific method by which things are looked at objectively, they're broken down analytically, uh, hypotheses are made, uh, inductions are made as opposed to deductions, so it's an inductive logic. Inductive means that you, you draw from the evidence in front of you the induction, the hypothesis that you want to test. Deduction means that you have a certain knowledge system in your head and you deduct, you deduce from that the hypothesis that should result from, it could be a dogma, it could be a religion, it could be just simply a paradigm that you believe exists and therefore you make a deduction from it. But genuine science is inductive. It's willing to change its principles, it's willing to change its, its paradigms, as indeed we see in modern physics. Modern physics is it's inductive, isn't it? It's willing to change its view of the universe, the cosmos, and the role of the observer. Um, the very, very nature of science changes under the impact of the new knowledge which is discovered in physics, like subatomic particles, the unity of the observer with what is being observed, the quant sub-quantum world, a subatomic world, of the so-called quantum reality. So physics has changed, and this scientific method is a paradigm, of course, the queen of the sciences. Behind that, you can think of the modern world view, which I refer to as M MWV um, l later on, and the modern worldview is basically a wider set of philosophical principles which underpins the scientific method. And the modern worldview states that the human consciousness is the height of, evol of evolution. It is evolved by accident. Uh, the universe is essentially dead and has produced life by accident, by random mutation. Life has developed um, and the, the right of human consciousness and its centre point, the ego, is to dominate this world and to have mastery over it and to use it as it sees fit. It's a very exploitative, it's a very dominating um, view, um, the modern worldview. The alternate worldview we can see emerging in the new metaphysics and that was really informing the reference I sent you, Mind Before Matter, that book, and I gave you a a small summary of it, and in which there are various authors, including Anne Baring, actually. And the alternative worldview is very different. It states a different set of principles, which we'll look at in a moment, but essentially they are at the opposite end of the spectrum from the modern worldview. And another simple philosophical 
guiding point through this system of knowledge is the first year philosophy course uh, where the student learns about various things including idealism and materialism. Remember I learned that in my first year, first term of philosophy and idealism is um, uh, uh, when you view the world or you view the mind uh, consciousness as an ideal, as it's, been, as it's been produced by a god or produced by some intelligence um, which is non-material. It's, like, it's an ideal, idealistic or we, uh, is the word we get from it, but idealism. Hegel, for example, is usually classified as an idealist. That is, he looks at history and says that there's some spirit running throughout history, isn't there? Uh, materialism is a view which says, well, no, the opposite is the case, that material values material forces, analytic intelligence, dead matter, which has to be understood in terms of its forces, its physics, or indeed in social terms, in terms of class struggle, material factors which can be um, looked at as concrete relationships in, in human beings or concrete material things in the, in, in, the, in the world constitute the view of materialism. The fields that we could look at and say, well, how are these fields of knowledge doing in the 21st century? Um, in terms of these simple ideas which we put forward, like idealism and materialism. Are they idealistic or materialistic? Is there a movement in these fields towards the alternative worldview, which tends to be more spiritual, more process orientated, more systems orientated, sees things as a whole, sees human beings as part of that whole, or are they dominated by the materialist worldview and the scientific method, which tends to be more analytic and materialist? Where on that spectrum do they lie? Yeah. And if we're looking at half a dozen or so of these fields of knowledge, um, and I made some, as it were, quick judgments on, on them, I had to say that the materialist worldview has dominated not only the, the 18th and 19th century but also the 20th and 21st century and is likely to continue. That no matter what discipline you go into, that the materialist worldview and the scientific method is the dominant one. It's the one that's taught in universities, it's the one that's taught in institutions across the world and even in those fields where you think most need some alternative worldview like economics, a field I know quite well, well you know, no matter what crisis we've gone through, the 2008 crisis, the ecological crisis, economics courses are still taught across the world broadly in the same way. They're still taught in the same principles as they were 40, 50, 100 years ago. It's amazing. And then when I was a, a teacher, I tried to introduce a course on crisis economics and e uh, economics of ecology. And basically it was just voted out and no, we need macroeconomics, we need microeconomics, we need business economics. This is what students are looking for and these alternative things are not relevant. Um, and uh, you know, blind man touching the elephant. No, no view of, of you know, even, even the wider field around one. It's just simply this is our field and this is what advances our field. And really what you're talking about is, is just airy-fairy nonsense. So this is, even in those fields which need it most, it, uh, I, I think my honest assessment is that the materialist worldview is totally dominant, not v very dominant, and only one or two fields have incorporated alternative worldviews to some extent. Strangely enough, the queen of the science, above all, <laughs> precisely where the great destroyer has, physics being the great destroyer of religion, right? And life sciences, the great destroyers of religion. These have been the fields that have actually surprised us the most. Well, particularly physics, because in the world of physics, we have come out with this different reality, the subatomic field, and the field of relativity theory has shown us that really our conscious dimension is only the middle sphere. It's what the human beings believe to be their reality. But it doesn't correspond to the reality that surrounds us or is above us in the macro field of relativity theory or in the subatomic field, in the micro fields, which constitute everything below our field of vision, so to speak. Um, and uh, so th this has been the most surprising. And string theory has been now around, belongs, does it belong in the materialist worldview or the alternative view? It's been around since the 1970s. Hologram, holographic analysis has been around since the 1980s. So string theory has actually come out with these amazing ideas that there's actually infinite number of universes. 
as if our universe was not big enough. They have now proposed a string theory that there's infinite numbers of universe. And uh, uh, they find it very difficult to find evidence for it, but they, they still keep this up as a, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a big theory. Holograms has been around now for some time, but it hasn't gone away. And more and more physicists are looking at string theory and becoming interested in it, and also ideas of black holes and holograms, and coming out with ideas which really belong in the world, you think of metaphysics rather than physics. Meta means above, doesn't it? So meta, the metaphysics, the world of religion, and the world of some superordinate reality, metaphysics, above the world, above physics. And they seem to be like metaphysicians rather than phys <laughs> physicists. Um, and their, their ideas have totally turned our normal ideas of reality on its head. And as Capra said in 1975, um, in his uh, very, uh, original first book, um, he said that it's very like Eastern mysticism. Mystics of the East um, correspond their views of so-called reality um, to the world of physics and quantum physics. That seems to have grown. That seems to be gaining more pace. And now physicists in the last 10 years are contemplating something that they never contemplated before. Up to 10 years ago, every physicist more or less said, mathematician, we can't look past the Big Bang, right? 13.8 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. We can prove it. There's all this evidence. And the evidence is good. Um, but uh, we can't go beyond that because the laws of physics break down. You can't make any sense of it. Now, a great number of physicists, I wouldn't say the majority, but a great number think of something that preceded the Big Bang. And they're beginning to construct mathematical models, which is the only thing that makes sense to them, <laughs> um, which uh, give them some kind of idea of what may have led towards the Big Bang. Of course, it's not going to be a mystery to people that there must have been a big contraction before the big expansion. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, all, it's, it's a very simple piece of mechanical logic. Um, and indeed, it's the one that I adopted in Sir and the Seed, and is in Hindu mythology. The, the contractions and expansions of the, of the breath of the, of the Brahman, of the universe, correspond to the expansion and contractions of, of the universes across the ages, across infinity. It's a wonderful idea. They came out with it thousands of years ago. And I think physics is edging towards that. And in string theory, they've even made this even more remarkable by suggesting that the, the contraction that may have existed before the current expansion, the Big Bang, was the, what we see in front of us regularly in terms of black holes. The, the black holes of the universe, which now we know right across the universe, and the certainly in the centre of every, sol uh, every uh, galaxy, aren't they? That they swallow matter, but then what happens to it? Well, physicists, you say, we don't know what happens to it. You can't say that, we can't say it's an invalid question. Now they're suggesting that this matter Vast amounts of matter in the cosmos are swallowed by the black holes, destroying the previous universe, and then spewing it out and creating a new universe. So our universe is a result of a black hole. We're looking at ourselves when we look back at 13.8 million, million years ago, taking our consciousness out to that far. We're looking at the black hole spewing out what came in before. We are that. So this has got really weird, hasn't it? It's got really weird and very exciting and very interesting. And you can't help but think metaphysically at this point, can you? They've stretched the metaphysics. Even the Hindus must be amazed at this. Uh, but uh, of course, the Hindus will insist that they, they got there first on these things. Um, and they were thinking about these things many thousands of years ago. So physics is the grand exception. The alternative worldview has come out with some amazing things. And it's certainly worthwhile keeping up to date with the vast advances in this field. Life sciences. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution, of course, has received increasing uh, support and the um, and dominant theory in the life sciences. Uh, it's been united in the synth synthetic view of, uh, of neo-Darwinism, the, the grand synthesis with Mendel's discovery of genetics, the great Czech monk, and also with the DNA discoveries in the 50s and 60s, Crick and Watson in Britain, um, who basically um, provided the basis for understanding the structure of DNA and the, and the human genome was now being cracked as well as the Neanderthal genome and lots of animals' genomes uh, from, for which the 21st century is going to be transformed by our knowledge of the genome, we, we think. 
So the life sciences look solidly in the, in the materialist worldview, don't they? That's by materialist analysis, Darwin's theory of evolution, Mendel's theory of genetics, the Darwinian, uh, the um, uh, theory of the DNA. It's all solidly materialistic, but the, you know, the material world, induction, logic, hypotheses, materialistic units, even the tiny, small chromosomes below that genes, these are the determinants of the life system. Right, so it seems a triumph for the modern worldview, doesn't it? However, there's lots of problems in it. Uh, it's not quite like physics where a, a new expanding alternative worldview seems possible, but there's something called facilitated evolution which you may come across, which is that there's lots of people, Stephen Goulding is one of them, Stephen Gould I think his name is, um, who have proposed that the, the, the big leaps in evolution cannot be explained by this, the, the, this synth synth synthesis theory. That the leaps are so fast and so intricate that there's no way the, the gene pools could have accounted for it with their mutational changes, which, although they can be fast, are a lot slower than what is required to account for these sudden punctuated equilibria, they're called, these sudden new leaps in evolution where you suddenly move into a like, human consciousness or the development of a wing suddenly comes very fast. The traditional theory of Darwin's theory is that everything develops very slowly by genetic mutation, bit by bit. It's a slow process organized, ordered process, but increasing amounts of evidence are saying, no, evolution makes these sudden leaps. And this is more facilitated by view of systems theory, isn't it? Systems theory, Capra, remember, and lots of others in the 20th century, but Capra seemed to sum this up, and said that you get these what's called emergent effects in the life process and in physics and in, 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 in social sciences, by which you get these sudden leaps which become possible as a result of some kind of build-up which you can't see and it's below the surface and suddenly create new forms and they're called um, 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 these emergent effects. Okay, the, so there are even things in biology, it's things at the side where we're thinking, hmm, this sounds very like what Wallace, remember Wallace and Darwin? They, they discovered evolution together and they decided to publish together, but Darwin had been doing it long before and he got the prize, so to speak. But Wallace was also out in, the, in the Indonesia and he was doing his research and actually got his letter to Darwin explaining natural selection before Darwin had published. So he's a brilliant young man. And he believed towards the end, uh, in, the, in his midlife, and wrote to Darwin that he believed that the natural selection theory of Darwin was not quite sufficient to explain the great variety and of, of evolution. And Darwin wrote to back to him saying, do not abandon our method, do not abandon the scientific method. It's a materialistic method. Um, please have your head screwed on, you're getting carried away there in the jungles of Indonesia. Um, um, please keep your scientific head on, like Freud said to Jung. You know, don't abandon our, our, our canon, our materialistic method, and give in to superstition. So, um, uh, but Wallace and Henri Bergson and so on, uh, Ilan Vital, have all suggested that there is something else operating in evolution which is um, remarkable and which can't quite be explained by the modern worldview. Other fields of knowledge, the evolution of our species, you would think that the evolution of human beings, we would find lots of things that, as it were, support the alternative worldview, wouldn't you? After all, you know, how have human beings developed their consciousness and so on. But if you look at the field of the evolution of our species, basically it's been dominated by the materialist worldview and the alternative view of something more spiritual or something more the mystery of consciousness has largely gone unexplored in this field. It's mostly explained according to the, evolu the, the evolutionists um, by, well, our consciousness developed as a result of random mutation. This is their usual answer. There were genetic random mutations between the Neanderthals and us. There are 200 variations in the genome between Neanderthals and us. And those were accounted for by the, 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 the 500 years of different, five, five, five million years of evolution that took place prior in developing a slightly different species bit by bit. So basically, that it's still dominated by the materialist worldview. Ecology is an exception because ecology is dominated by a crisis, isn't it? The field of ecology. We have scientific ecology dominated by the material worldview. Then we have deep ecology, which says, no, there's a crisis in our world system and that we have to be aware of our consciousness doing this to the planet. Um, we have been responsible for this and we are deeply immersed in our ecology. We're not separate human beings from it, uh, from the rest of creation, from the rest of evolution, sorry. 
um, 20, 20, uh, 20th century and I expect will increase besides systems view of life instead of looking at an individual component on the elephant it's trying to look at the total system uh, process theory of course Whitehead has suggested this in the early 20th century that you've got to look at things as processes and not as nuts and bolts and bits and pieces to be analysed and put together separately that the whole thing is a process system and is a world of flux and change so we do have philosophers in the 20th century who I anticipate will have increasing influence. Whitehead at the beginning of the 20th century is just an ex one example, there's lots of others. Um, and Capra towards the, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, their views of process and change and being part of a larger system are all part of inevitably of a greater view which we must incorporate and I anticipate will increasingly challenge the materialist worldview. And indeed we're realising that the centre of this view is the human being and that we have lots of study of the right hand now and the left hand, left hemispheres, the right hemispheres of the brain which show exactly this dichotomy. The left hand side of our brain as we now know uh, tends to look at things analytically, materialistically, tends to break things down and so it, it's ideally suited to the modern world view and the scientific method isn't it? We would expect therefore that in those parts of the world where the modern world view and scientific method are dominant, that there'll be a dominance of the left-hand side of the brain. People think more analytically, more logically, uh, more rationally, more coldly, less emotionally, less intuitively and so on. And indeed I think that's broadly what we find if you look at our educational systems. There's only very few parts of our educational system which encourage the right, encourage the right hemisphere point of view. The right hemisphere is more slightly more emotional but it's certainly more intuitive and it certainly looks at the context of things, the gestalt of things a lot more doesn't it? And it's, we now know it's this balance between the right and the left hemisphere as Jung would have said the conscious and the unconscious it's to my mind a development of what Jung was talking about anyway and depth psychology that this unity of ourselves which is essentially what we're looking for this integration is vital and that systems view and process theory uh, which will gain force and this alternative worldview uh, will unite with the materialist worldview to provide another synthesis in the 21st century instead of being separate and opposing camps. That's my belief. Other fields, history, economics, psychotherapy, neuroscience, I could go on and on but just take two that I know something about to wrap this up. Um, economics has huge gaps in its systems analysis. It generally does not look at how it integrates with ecology for example and its destruction for the planet. It generally does not look at how human beings destroy um, other societies. It doesn't take account of externalities, external costs. It doesn't take account of the um, uh, huge indirect costs which are caused by modern industrial systems and their impact upon nature. It doesn't count those costs. It counts things in a very narrow analytic and materialist manner uh, accountancy manner and even despite the crisis of 2008 and despite the, um, uh, the ecology crisis that we all know is happening in front of us the economics is, is, is the last to change in these matters and, and they have a lot to answer for. Psychotherapy has also been dominated by this dichotomy between the modern and the uh, worldview and the alternative worldview. The modern worldview you could say was represented by Freud modernism, scientific method, um, looking at the human beings and discovering the unconscious, an amazing discovery but then saying it's explained materialistically really, it's explained by for Freud sexual and aggressive forces, uh, instinctual forces from the psyche are explaining what's going on and certainly that'll take you some distance and certainly you find some evidence for that. Of course we, we, you know, we come from the world of, of creatures and animals and we've evolved but uh, young represents the, um, the alternative worldview, a worldview which actually believes in some unity of the psychotherapist and the client or uh, between mankind and nature um, which looks at the scientific method is able to use it but at the same time moves to the realm of what I'm just going to summarise his alchemy and his Gnosticism and uh, all the other things, of the alternative things that he developed and pioneered and has given to us as tremendous gifts as his um, as the transpersonal. Transpersonal is now a big word but that actually word originated with Jung. 
the transpersonal. There's, never, there's part of the human psyche which is transpersonally linked. That vision of Jung has just gained in force by those areas of psychotherapy and neuroscience and so on, which see the human being increasingly as having this dimension, not just an instinctual dimension, not just an emotional dimension, or a conscious dimension, or an unconscious explained by our instincts dimension, but higher dimensions which reach the transpersonal, in which the distinction between ourselves and the nature and ourselves and the other breaks down, just as it breaks down in physics. That distinction between ourselves and the electron or the particle um, breaks down as two separate entities and the idea of entanglement and unity and uh, uh, this participation mystique as we've called it this unity with the world becomes evident so psychotherapy belong you know has this problem also there's a great deal of it like psychology dominated by the modern worldview proper diagnosis, proper clinical practices, separation between client and, 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 and analyst, um, uh, looking at things analytically, verbally, trying to understand the source of things. It's a uh, modern worldview, isn't it? Modern, it's, it's, it's modern science. But then, when you ex do explore that, as I've had to, you run up against the limits of, of its healing capacity, of its capacity for change in personality. You get a certain distance with that worldview. But then in, uh, in the psyche, you, you rapidly come across parts of it which cannot be explained by the modern, uh, modern worldview. You have to use another set of tools. And that's why I wrote Healing Intelligence, because I, I began to rea realise that the healing that takes place and that most people are seeking can only be achieved by other methods rather than the analytical method offered by my training. And you have to use something else and you have to put yourself in there in some way, otherwise it doesn't work. And so I began to become fascinated by this healing intelligence and this mystery of what we can, I'm just going to summarise the alternative worldview. I could go on about that, of course, but um, I'm going to leave that and just finally end with that neuroscience. And of course, a, a lot of you read and were inspired by the McGilchrist, which looks at this two sides of ourselves, where we can see this division between materialism and idealism, world, the, the different worldviews, analytic versus the intuitive and the spiritual played out in the different sides of our brain. So what we're doing in the world in terms of our consciousness is ultimately reflected in ourselves, the observer, who is looking out at the world. We and the elephant are the same. Or as the Hindu said, you know, Brahman is ultimately Atman. Our individual souls are ultimately part of the great cosmos. We could go on, but we haven't got time. So. Um, Reactions against the modern worldview, of course, all the world's religions, the perennial philosophy, the wisdom traditions. Um, perennial philosophy is basically across the ages, those philosophies and, and cults, religions, and so on, which believe there's some underlying reality underneath our phenomenal world, which is quite different from what we imagine and what we analyze. The Romantics, Blake in particular, much of classical music, Kabbalah, Gnostics, alchemy, Sufism, the rebirth of the soul etc. All, of course, have strong reactions against the modern worldview. The status of the modern worldview, however, is that it is dominant in most disciplines, however, it will be increasingly challenged. And indeed, as the conditions underlying the modern worldview change, ecology, economics, and the crises of the 21st century, increasing numbers of people will look at the modern worldview and saying, this is precisely what is advanced us to a certain extent, but also got us into deep trouble. Now, the crises of the, um, of the 21st century, if we just went back slightly to the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and you were to read a book by Heilbrunn, which I recommended to you before in the uh, Prospect, Human Prospect, remember two lectures ago, and the Heilbrunn was a lovely little book and uh, called the Human Prospect, and in it he, he, he presents the mood of pessimism that existed in the 1970s. The book went through every decade uh, a revision, but the opening forward is about the mood of pessimism and about the dangers of nuclear war and the dangers of the uh, po politicians no longer being trustworthy, about economic crises, so on. 
strange, this was in the 1970s, this is like now. He, he was so ahead, he not ahead of his time, but so much we lived within this paradigm that things seem in some ways strangely familiar. He presented a view of the his front cover, uh, his, his emblem, was indeed of Atlas. Atlas who bears the world in Greek mythology. So it's a bearer of the world. The world is in difficulty and is in crisis. And the task of uh, politicians or statesmen and thinkers and so on, um, uh, the elders, is to bear up this world and, and, and survive. As opposed to the old images of Prometheus, remember? Prometheus gets the fire, gets the light of consciousness, or the light of science, the light of no knowledge, and steals it from the gods and is punished for that, isn't he? Remember his liver is uh, tied to a rock in the Caucasus and his liver is pecked out by day and at night it renews and the eagle returns. He goes through this terrible punishment. It's their version of the fall from the Garden of Eden, isn't it? That the, 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 the tree of knowledge that was gained by Prometheus or by Adam and Eve suffers a terrible consequence. And of course nowhere do we see that more than in modern technology and modern knowledge and modern military technology when the result of our knowledge can destroy us. Um, other visionaries, uh, we could pick out hundreds, but the, the ones I just picked out, uh, first of all at random, were Carl Sagan um, from the 1990s, who was, uh, he wrote a, a, a famous speech um, in front of, for the United Nations in, I think it was 1995 or 6. Um, it was called Visions of the 21st Century, title of our, our talk. And in it, he talks about the, the great achievements of the human race in terms of medicine, technology, and economic growth, and the unity of the human race, and that our knowledge systems now are showing us that the human race is more united than ever before. We all come from Africa. We all come from a small band of, of, of people who left Africa. Um, we, we are united in our DNA. Uh, our consciousness and our religions is broadly the same. We are brothers or at least cousins. Come on, let's get our act together and be peaceful. And no need to bomb each other and kill each other and so on. He ends his talk with the note of warning about technology and science and military danger. Um, his recommendation is that the only answer to that, having unleashed this, opened this Pandora's box, the result of the Promethean stealing of knowledge, the opening of the Pandora's box and letting this out into the world, is that we now it's open and out, that we really let it out fully and we all become more com knowledgeable of science and knowledgeable of what's, what we're facing, rather than less so. Um, he wrote a famous speech, which is on YouTube, which I'm, I haven't got time to show you because it's going to take up a good five, six minutes, but it's worth seeing, and I sent you the link to it, called The Pale Blue Dot. And um, it's rather cheesy, and there's lots of background music and so on. But basically, and he's, he, he loves his own voice and he loves his own grandeur, if you listen to it. And, uh, but it's great stuff. And um, he, uh, he requested NASA to turn around Voyager, one of the Voyager satell um, uh, spacecraft, uh, unmanned spacecraft, as it was leaving our solar system, and take a, the last photograph of the planet. Remember? Uh, did you come across that idea? It's called the pale blue dot. And you see this section of the cosmos, it just all looks blank and grey. And if you look and look and look, look, you see a pixel, and it's just, that, that's Earth. Uh, a view of six, is it billion or million miles away, um, the, the space voyager is just leaving the universe. So Carl Sagan requested NASA that they turn the camera around and take a last shot of Earth. Because he knew what he was doing, he got that last shot, and then he made this uh, famous speech, which is often quoted in United Nations and big, big, big events and so on. You quote Carl Sagan, and... Um, and you can see it on YouTube, of course, now. And basically, it's a very emotional account of looking at the blue dot from a vast distance and saying, that's where we fought all our battles, that's where people killed each other, that's where we loved, that's where we hated, that's where, we, that's where all our lives were, and, that f and a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of that little pixel in the middle of nowhere. And all our fighting has been about that. You know, but it's the only place we've got, and it's our home. That's where we're from, and there's nowhere else to go in the universe. There's nowhere else in the solar system we're going to get to. We've got, this is where, he says, we make our stand. <laughs> <laughs> it's all great stuff. It's like American Frontier stuff. This is where we make our stand, and it's live or die here. So get your act together, you know. And it, it's lovely, you must see it. But ruined by the background music. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to play it. The um, great stuff, Carl Sagan, great astronomer, um, 
and the very knowledgeable about the ecology and the uh, developing dangers for the earth and the dangers of the military systems and so on, uh, on the money in the 1990s. Um, if we advance forward into the 21st century and just took out a few visionaries, the ones I wanted to choose really were ones that showed some optimism and some hope. Because, uh, as you know, there's enough pessimism uh, that we can dwell, uh, dwell in, and there's enough pessimism I can dish, it, dish out as well, as I've been reminded. Um, but it, do we have any answers to some certain fundamental crises, like the ecological crisis, which is only one of our crises, right? But it's a very important one, and it's going to interact in a systems way with all the rest. Are there any visionaries out there who can offer us anything? Or is it just doom and gloom and... That's it. Lester Brown, Jeremy Rifkin, Am Amory Lovins have all written great books. Uh, some of them are free on the internet, and I've given you the links. And the most famous of all is called Lester Brown, Plan B. Great title. And in it, he suggests that um, there is a solution, um, that the analysis seems to be fairly clear and simple, and what it requires is an action program to put into place a series of engineering and uh, e ecological programs, uh, renewable energy programs and so on, which uh, are now possible, are economic and achievable, but it, what, we, what it would require is a wartime type economy. And he quotes the, uh, or reminds us of the 1945, 1945, 1943 bombing of Pearl Harbor by the Japanese and the Americans. I may not have the date exactly right, um, 41, 42, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and, and took out most of the American fleet and looked set to dominate, and uh, were advancing very, very firmly and uh, brutally. And um, the president called in the, uh, the major car factories and said, um, you will no longer produce any cars for the next two years. You're going to produce tanks, you're going to produce airplanes and weaponry. And the whole American industrial system changed instantly to produce vast numbers of tanks, not just for America at all, but actually even fed the Russian Russian war. And Russia would not have won the war against Hitler if it hadn't been supplied by the American tanks and planes and, and weaponry. So it was an amazing achievement. And it was done by the American industrial economy, which changed round on a sixpence in no time at all to produce weaponry that could, could, could change the fate of the planet, which it did, change the fate of the Second World War. Otherwise, it would have been very, very different. Hitler would have won, and the Japanese would probably would have won, and we'd lived in a very different world. So he said, what we need is that kind of spirit, that it that we can change our industrial system, what we don't have is the political will and the political leadership. And on that, I, 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 I feel very much in accord with what he's saying. Uh, is that it's not, I, I think people are ready for it, uh, but they, they lack leadership. And I think we have a crisis of leadership in the Western world, and I've said so many times, and I think that's the, I think that's the fundamental cause. And Toynbee put his finger on this, and he said, it's when creative minorities lose their verve and lose their vision that really civilizations collapse. And if we only had creative leadership that could stand up, I quoted controversially two, two, two lectures ago, if only Obama had stood up and, 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 and said, instead of posing in front of the damn camera, if he just said, listen, let's, uh, let's get this act on and, and, and just abolish oil. By the end of the decade, you know, we're going to actually replace the, uh, you know, the, the combustion engine with, 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 with electricity or, and renewable energy, and it's going to be a national program, like a military program, and America's going to lead the way. But it was only in response to violence that that happened. In Pearl Harbor, it was violence that made it happen. It was, it, it was very fast, uh, brutal violence, and a life or death threat. Yeah. Yeah. So the way it happens at the moment, it doesn't seem that way, does it? Everyone can put the five-year plan ahead of it and say, and everyone can say, put a question mark and say, will it really be six feet by the end of the century that water will rise? Or will it be just one? And can we get away with it? You know, that's someone else's problem. So really, it's, it's, it's like an accumulation of a deadly poison inside of the system or a deadly cancer, which accumulates slowly rather than the uh, you know, sudden life or death thing, which, which jolts you into change. Or is that thing underneath that creates the Is that is that process hidden mm -hmm. underneath the surface that creates the shift? What kind of evolutionary shift could that be thinking of, Jason? Uh, well, I, I'm I'm interested in what Sloan Wilson says that uh, uh, evolution has shifted from the body to the mind, and that we're in a place of evo evolving symbolically, and have been like um, Sapiens Harari has been saying over the last seventy thousand years. 
but it, uh, I, I agree with you. It doesn't happen instant. Uh, it doesn't happen over. The bits of it happen over a long process, and then there's a sudden shift. Mm -hmm. So that was a sudden shift seventy thousand years ago. We think there's a shift now, simply driven by numbers. Now that uh, I think what we're facing is the level of trauma we have to go through mm -hmm. in order to allow that shift to take place. So the event you point to that transforms, wakes people up uh, to the toxicity that was uh, that was underneath our mm -hmm. culture in fascism at the end of the yeah. imperial structures in, in Western Europe um, uh, shifted when it was recognised by the by the Americans who were holding still an Enlightenment pole, but the Democratic, in inverted commas, Enlightenment pole, saying we've got to change this. Yeah. And, and put their whole industrial weight yes. behind it. Well, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's trauma which, 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 which will change things. Uh, it's not going to change by argument. No. But no. the argument can lay the ground, can't yeah. it? Uh, yeah, oh, absolutely. And you have to continue. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the greater numbers and the fecundity of argument, the number of different... Yes. Uh, Possibilities that are there yes. at the juncture that the whatever the crisis is going to be, and we won't mm. know. I don't think where it comes from comes. There will be something that can be picked up. I mean, I think the knowledge that uh, once it's disseminated that there is a plan B, mm. that it can work, and what these other people are saying that there are engineering and there are renewable energies solutions which are possible. It's not theoretical. No, ideas. I mean, they're, they're practical and, they're, and moreover, they're economic. In the, when the trauma arrives and the time for some emergent transformative change occurs, then people will seize upon these and say, look, this is not just airy fairy theory, there but, is but, but change in the, possible. But in the, in the systemic sense that you were describing, or in the white Indian sense, that happens inside as much as it happens outside. So it has to be that reflective process. I think that part of the, as we'll see in the second half, part of the process of change will be driven also by uh, an, an awareness on the inside. It's not just on the outside, as you say, but something on the inside that's happening inside human beings. And people have pointed this for a long time, haven't they? The great vacuum that exists inside human beings. The seeing, uh, you know, seeing the, our, our children take on a different consciousness and uh, drugs and pornography and collapse of families and, uh, and all the other things afflicting you know, the, the global economy and particularly the West. We're all, all creating inner conditions of dissatisfaction, which will add to that as well and say, it's a total change that's required. But you can look at this in the model of addiction. That's it. This is exactly what happens. You come to a point where yeah. you say, it's got change. Yes, we're addicted. Yeah. Yes. The It, ha it has these abilities. I'll explain to you another time if you, if you want. But the banks have this ex possibility of expanding the money supply and expanding the credit system. And in the boom period, that system gets out of hand. So he analyzes three stages of debt, the hedge, the speculative, and the Ponzi stages. Mm -hmm. So the hedge period, think of the lead up to the 2007 crisis. The hedge is when money is lent to the banking system uh, to people who can pay the principal back you lend a million, you can pay the million back, and also pay the interest. Hedge, and you make a hedge and you say, I'll charge you 5%, and so that will allow for a few failures here and there. Okay, hedge. Second stage, as the boom develops, speculative, as the frenzy comes in. The speculative is when money is lent out, on large scale, to people who can only pay back the interest and not the principal. How does that happen? Logically, well, people say, my house price is rising. If my house price is ri rises, then I'm going to be okay. I don't have to pay back the principal. It's going to be tiny in 20 years' time anyway, the amount I've lent. 
the, the inflation is taking place. And the house I bought for 100,000 is now worth a million, so I don't care if I borrowed 80,000 and I couldn't pay it back in 20 years' time, that'll be easy to pay back because I'll be a rich person based upon my million pound house. So the, so the inflation of the assets, in this case housing, which a lot of us are acquainted with, but that applies right throughout the whole economy, okay? the inflation is done on the basis of, sorry, the, the borrowing is done on the basis of anticipated inflation. Anticipated rising prices which will make you wealthier and allow you to pay back the money. So. All the bank's worried about is if you can just pay the, pay the interest back for the, for the meantime, the asset will take care of itself in the long run. Getting riskier, isn't it? Third stage, the Ponzi stage. Ponzi, of course, um, uh, early 20th century, um, schemes that basically pulled in money and then pretended to invest in it and then pulled in more money and paid people back from the money that's pulled in so people thought they were rich the word goes out and more people pour money into the scheme. But essentially, there's no real investment taking place and there's no real value being created. It's just more and more people are pulled into the scheme and therefore the people who control the money are able to keep people satisfied with the high gains they make per annum. But no one, very few people ask for their principal back. And that is robbed by the Ponzi people. Um, so Ponzi schemes, there have been in plenty, but the Ponzi scheme is when money is lent out on a large scale and the banks or the lender doesn't expect the principal or the interest payments to be paid, but expects and hopes for rising asset prices for the house to rise. So the bank says, we'll lend the subprime people, our presidents have told us and we're told all over the place, we've got to include people in the capitalist system, they lend money out en masse to people who obviously can't pay it back, but what does it matter? Because their house prices are rising anyway. If they can't pay it back, we'll take the house off them and then we'll, we'll get our money back. So lending has become completely dislocated from any economic prudence, hasn't it? It's become totally speculative or really it's become Ponzi. So when that housing asset collapses, inevitably as most markets who have been inflated will collapse, then they're caught out and the Ponzi scheme collapses, housing, in this case the housing prices collapse or whatever the market we're talking about, and vast amounts of panic sets in and vast losses are made. These Minsky moments, these moments of great change when the cartoon character runs over the edge of the cliff and continues running for a while and then, whoop, and then drops, these Minsky moments happen in the economy quite a lot. Finance therefore matters. A lot of economists have been taught for years, as I, I was, that finance was simply an intermediary process, a transmission system of pipes from lenders to savers at certain rates of interest. And it all seemed very logical and balanced and is built into the, all the systems we were taught. No one taught us, except Karl Marx and then later Minsky, no one taught us that there was a vast inflationary system happening which was destabilising the whole economic system. And indeed, that's what happened. He published this in the 1990s. There's plenty of crashes preceding him, which he analysed. Economics blindly ignored and couldn't build into their theories and never taught their students. So we had bankers at the very top, like Alan Greenspan, who ran the Federal Reserve, the most powerful banking system in the world, who was worshipped like a god, the great magician as he was called, and who was totally wrong on suppressing any regulatory control of the banking system and just believed it could expand indefinitely and it would be a self-equilibrating system and the bad money would be chased out by good money and it would all balance in the end and we'd all just get wealthier and everyone believed him. And after the crash of 2008 he was called in as the head of the banking system, the greatest bank in the world, the Federal Reserve, and, he said, and they said, well why did you tell us all this? And he said, I was wrong. No, he was greedy. It was greedy. It was greedy it? It's an addiction. And ran. And ran. And still very wealthy and still, no, no one went to prison for all this and no one, no one was sacked and no, 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 no one was, was even, even pilloried. They, they, they got away with everything. Uh, probably because most people just can't understand the money system. But the, one of the reasons why we can't understand it is that those people who should be doing the teaching of the economics out to the public at large have been taught in a particular system which is got blinkers on. They're around this big elephant called the economy and ecology and the system and they're, they're going, yes, that's because what have I been taught? Self-equilibrating markets, self-balancing systems and that must be the answer somewhere. And all this crisis thing, that'll sort itself out, push that aside for the time being. Denial, repression of the knowledge 
and eventually active re repression of the knowledge, sacking people or putting people out, out, out of their jobs who were complaining and, and bringing another worldview into, into matters. In other words, the 2008 crisis, the biggest crisis in the Western economies, which we have not recovered from, everyone thinks it was 10, 12 years ago, Britain has not moved on since that crisis. Wages have not moved up one fraction for the average British worker. Do you know that? We are stagnant. And that applies to a great deal of the Western world. The, 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 the European Union is stagnant since 2008, and the American economy is stagnant, yet no one is telling us this information. We have stalled completely our economic growth, and our system has en encountered a massive failure and is not able even to understand it. This elephant is in the room, is not a, we're not able to understand what has happened here because we don't have the tools in front of us. And people like Minsky are a totally of the alternative worldview. And Alan Greenspan and the like are totally at the centre of their explanations for why this has happened. So, uh, Alan, yeah. this trauma, this inner change, what's it, what's, what's it going to be? We're going to see this in a moment, but essentially if we look at it as a systems point of view, it'll be a union of different systems, ecological, e economic and political and social traumas, which will all interact in a cycle effect, which is partially analysed, very interestingly, by Weiss, Weiss uh, Martin Weiss, um, in that link I gave you to Money and Markets, which is a remarkable website. Um, and in it, he suggests from probably a narrower point of view from what I'm suggesting, but nevertheless, as an economist, he has great vision. He's suggesting that there are these horsemen of the apocalypse, he calls them, um, and he calls them seven horses. I've added an eighth. Um, and um, uh, seven horses of the apocalypse are ones which are working in cycles and which are gathering pace now and are unleashing themselves at this very moment. So what are they? The first horseman of the apocalypse is debt the enormous debt of the Western world. It used to be said that 40% debt was the maximum any economy could bear. And we weren't allowed, the European Union said, no one is allowed to go beyond the 40% debt. Every country broke that. Britain has almost 100% of its GDP. That's the gross product for a year, GDP, the gross domestic product. How much of that are you allowed to go into debt without being in danger? And it used to be said 40% was the danger point. Britain is now at 80, 85. Of, it, uh, of national debt, just national debt, the government debt, never mind the rest of our debt, the national debt compared to our GDP. It doubled during the economic crisis. The European Union has a vast range of debt. It stretches to Greece, which has 250% of its GDP in debt, completely unpayable. Italy, which has 220% of its GDP in debt, unrepayable. Spain, large amounts in debt. I mean, every country is way, way over the 40% uh, debt ratio. In other words, the West has entered completely into debt. And it's floating along as if very little is happening. Imagine going to a house to check its, the state of economics of, 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 of the house. Imagine meeting the father who's only working two days a week, the mother who's cracked out of her head on something, the sons who are um, uh, half unemployed and... And, and, and interested in their music and things like this, and everyone's going on holiday. And you say, well, you know, wait, wait, wait a minute, you're, you're only two days a week, and you're a big consumer, and you're this, that, and the other, and so on. You think this is, so many families like this, and um, the, um, uh, how are you going on holiday? Well, we're going, we're credit, debt, you know, that's how we're doing it, we've got credit cards. Well, that, that is similar to the economy. It's, it's no longer, it's technically bankrupt. The Western economies, and America particularly, are technically bankrupt. They're way beyond any rational, prudent measure of debt. Yeah. Um, so if they're technically bankrupt, what would usually happen? If you're bankrupt as a business, so I'm a small business, we have to declare I'm bankrupt. Yeah. And then I could no longer trade, unless I open up another business. Yeah. So... If you're a country, which is essentially a business, money in, money out, from a finance perspective, who do you declare you're bankrupt to? Because we're bankrupt. The, 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 there's an issue there about whether you're technically insolvent or not. So I ran a charity that was technically bankrupt. But we had, uh, we didn't pay ourselves for about three to five months to 
depending on who it was. And we said, so the money will come in further down the line. We can manage to get through it. We actually happened to do that. It was fine. Everybody was looking comfortable not going to pay you. So it's when that, it's, it's that point when you're actually insolvent rather than just appear to be technically insolvent. So what is being said, I think, is that these debts will be ultimately repayable. Unless those debts are called in by whoever we borrowed the money from. China. Beforehand. So there's, there's three ways of, of, of the debt getting reduced. One way is inflation. If you owe if you owe £100 to someone and you have inflation of 10% a year, then in a few years' time that £100 is worth a lot less, isn't it? So the countries of the West, and Japan also, which has 250% of its GDP in debt, Japan is the most, in the most danger of all. The... Um, if there's s s strong inflation, then over a decade or so, that the debt you have is, in real terms, reduced. You still pay the £100 back, but it's worth a lot less. One. So you pray for inflation. Unfortunately, the West has not been able to create the inflation. It's, it's pushed huge amounts of money into the economies, which should have created inflation. Right? But it hasn't, because the consumers of Japan and the West, including Japan and the West, and of America have so reduced their consumption after the fear of 2008 that that has counterbalanced the injection of the money from the governments into the system. So the consumers have reduced their, their uh, for certainly up to recently, their, con their consumption. That means that the money has basically gone into the hands of, what's well gone into the hands of the banks first of all, and the banks have pushed this money into the stock exchanges and into speculative capital. And therefore, the stock exchanges have boomed. So we've had inflation, but it's been the stock exchanging, housing prices, where the money is accumulated in the banking system and those who've got access to the money. But the rest of us have said, oh, I don't want to borrow any more, more money from the banks. So I'm not going to spend it because that's dangerous, despite the low interest rates. So in other words, the inflation, which was hoped for, has only taken place in certain parts of the system, in stock markets and so on, which has benefited the rich people even more and created more inequality. So inflation is the first way you get rid of debt, but that's not happening very much. The second way you get rid of debt is that you simply say, we can't pay. Venezuela's just done that and said, we're cancelling the debt, we'll give you 10p on the dollar or 10 cents on the dollar or 1 cent or just go fish. Um, and uh, you can't get you can't your money back. So you can renege on the debt. Many countries have done that before. Argentina is a famous example, um, and um, and can end up with uh, far far reduced payments. So you can renege, inflation. Um, you can, um, if, if you're a country like um, who has its own independent currency. The European Union countries don't have independent currency, do they? They have the euro, which is controlled by the Central European Bank. Britain has an independent currency as the pound, right? It didn't join the euro. America is an independent currency, it's the dollar. Because the central banks and the government print the dollars and print or the digital currency and have the rights to do so, then they can print infin infinite amounts of it. As they print infinite amounts of it to pay back their debt and the social services and policing and keep up the infrastructure of a country, as they print this money, then it depends upon the people who receive the money and debt whether they, they will accept it or not. If you've got the dollar, then people basically say, we'll accept it, because the dollar is the world reserve currency. It's, you can pay lots of things in dollars. So that allows the, the government to get away with huge debt by printing dollars and therefore uh, offering that as payment for their debt, and people saying, well, we'll accept it, even though the dollar is being relatively devalued by small amounts of inflation. So it's all based on trust, which could... Trust in the currency. Moment, yes. Really. When that trust in the currency collapses, and this is what Martin Weiss has pointed out, he says there'll come a, a tipping point, a turning point, a trauma point, when the, uh, these huge amounts of debt which have been created, basically the, the lenders eventually say, no, we don't believe you can pay this back anymore. Uh, we don't believe you can even pay the interest payments back. This has become like a Ponzi scheme. You're just creating money and we are giving the money back, but the money is de devalued or deflated because what we can buy with your yens or your pounds is less than we anticipated. When the, eventually the lender says, no, we're not going to lend you money anymore, then the borrower, the governments of the West, can, uh, they're, they're, they're what's called their bond markets, 
Bond markets is the government of government debt, treasury bonds and treasury bills and so on. We call it, we call it the bond market. That bond market collapses and government can't borrow money. Interest rates shoot up from very low rates at the moment to 7, 8, 10, 15, 20%. And the country then becomes even more technically bankrupt, even less able to pay even the interest on this debt. So it's just like the Ponzi scheme and the speculative and hedge thing. Initially, people are willing to get an interest payment for, the, for lending the government money, bonds. Then eventually they realise they're not going to get the principal back, but they're hoping for the interest. And eventually the government says, we can't even pay the interest. And therefore you get no money back. And, there, and, and, then, and, and, then, and then you have global panic. Vice, Vice reckons this panic is going to go from Japan, the uh, government markets, bond markets will collapse, to the European Union and then to America. But in the meantime, the American markets will gain enormous expansion uh, as money pours into America in flight capital from around the world, pours into the American stock exchange, driving up the Dow Jones and the other indexes in America to unheard of heights, which is what is happening in America despite its economic problems. So what Vice has is he has a finger on the money. He knows exactly what's happening. But surely um, there has to be a, an end game with currency because if there's all this flight money, it's got to end somewhere. People have got to put their money somewhere. And if the chosen currency is the dollar, then people will have to, by proxy, continue to trust in that dollar to say everyone's in debt to, the ch to China, but China's put their flight money in the dollar. They've got to trust it because their money's in the dollar, so the dollar's not going to fall. So that's just my well, 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 wrong? well. At that point, if the dollar really, if the dollar really started collapsing, and it's the end point for, for yes, all of the currencies flow to the dollar for safety and for security. Yes, that's correct. But if the dollar eventually collapsed, or there was a military crisis in America, right, mm -hmm. uh, bombing or something, and the New York Stock Exchange went down the drain, or something happened. Uh, and the economy collapsed and the, and the political administration went to war and you've got lunatic leaders in America suddenly taking over, etc. These kind of scenarios, which we're just beginning to see happening, thinking, you know, oh, uh, uh, there's captain of the ship, is he? You know, let, let me find another ship. Uh, well, that's what happens to money eventually. Ven money says eventually, well, actually, I don't feel safe even here. I used to feel safe here. We'll go somewhere else. We'll go to somewhere else where we feel safe. Maybe it's China eventually or something. Not at the moment, but or it's a basket of currencies, or maybe it's back into gold, or so some, you seek security somewhere. But essentially, at that point, that tipping point, it's like 1929, and it's like every other crisis we've ever known, the vastly inflated prices, the bond markets, the housing prices, the speculative investments, the stock exchanges, which have built up huge amounts of wealth, and have, I mean, since 2008 they've boomed, even though the real production hasn't taken any advance. This speculative inflation will collapse, and you get a terrific collapse of prices, market prices, stock market prices, bond prices, and you get a, a terrific loss of wealth that happens, like happened in the 1930s in America and Western Europe. It's a terrific loss of wealth. And, then, and, and, and the prices reduced back to a level where they really should have never left in the first place because of all the speculation which has driven them up. So it's a speculative boom that's going to burst at some point. The investment technique is to actually know when and to take advantage of, uh, and that's the real skill. I mean, any, anyone can say it's going to be a speculative burst one day. It's got to happen one day, that's for sure. You know, it always has. But who can ride, who can ride the wave? And who can get out of that wave on time with their money intact or grown and be able to pull their money out and grow? Martin Weiss has given a lot of advice on this. He says there's a coming catastrophe with the cycles which are coming in. Money, debt. Money is the expansion of the money supply, which has been huge in, in Japan, America, Europe and America um, in, in the last, since the 2008 crisis. It's been the expansion of money supply by about $8,000 billion dollars which is a very significant fraction of global GDP. Inequality has grown during this period. Vast inequality has grown. I mean, uh, China particularly has had a tremendous boom, hasn't it? Its workers have actually increased. While our wages have s been stagnant for 10 years, China's wages have basically tripled in the last 10 years. The average wage in China has tripled. But yet, the inequality in China has grown greater than anywhere else in the world because the, the people at the top are gaining even more and more. 
So the inequ- and, and basically getting richer at the bottom doesn't make you happy if people at the top are getting a lot more. It creates more resentment. <laughs> you don't get rid of resentment by, by, by getting more money, you know. People are always comparing themselves with other people. So the, the, the inequality that's driving the West and driving China and driving Russia, and particularly China at the moment, and, and, and Britain is very severe, uh, is leading to a terrific crisis. Corruption on a world scale, all the, all the measurements of corruption, we have better scales of measurement nowadays, have shown an increased level of corruption around the world. Division, political division, economic division, division between parties is breaking out in America, in Europe, just come back from Catalonia two days ago, there's another example, someone who goes to Poland, it's, it's also move, uh, strong movements to the right. Um, the uh, divisions in Latin America are very substantial, divisions in, in Russia and China. The amount of divisions by any other measure, by any measure, are severe and increasing. The amount of tyranny in the world is increasing also. The movement towards tyranny and control is increasing. And the movement in the war cycle is unremitting. And five years ago, whereas no one could have talked of the scale of wars, of like nuclear war and, and, and so on, nowadays it's become commonplace. The, the, the mood for war has changed substantially. And you can see the mood of these leaders, these leaders who have never known war in their own lifetimes, suddenly think they can start throwing these things around, pressing buttons and, uh, and beating their chest as if they're in the back of a jungle. I mean, it's just extraordinary, the changes on the global leadership scheme. And these people call themselves leaders, but really there's a crisis of world leadership. And the movement towards war is severe. What he doesn't mention is the eighth crisis, is the ecological crisis, which we all know is leading towards an interacting syst- systemic effect with all of the others. Weiss has done a remarkable analysis of these cycles that are happening, and, s- and he's claimed that they're all actually breaking now. They're uh, coinciding of these cycles, the war cycle, the money cycle, the debt cycle, uh, which across many hundreds of years you can track. And they are coinciding now for what he calls the apocalypse. However, he has good news for all individual investors. If you go to his website and invest your money... <laughs> He's very, very convincing, by the way. Very, very convincing. He also gave away, three weeks ago, for your information, and I, I, I downloaded it very quickly, he gave a list of 300 investments and graded them into A's, B's and C's because they've got a credit rating agencies, which is one of the best in the world, Vices. And he gave away huge amounts of information about the investments that you should make and ones you should avoid and so on, with lists of companies and lists of banks and grading A star and B star. Phenomenal knowledge he gave away. He gives away a lot of knowledge compared to all the rest of them who make a lot of fancy claims but actually give away very little. Um, remarkable website, really recommend it. So finally, um, the, uh, we come towards the end of this. Would anyone like to make any comments on the current crisis and their potential solutions that have been offered? 2018, 2019-20 in Europe, a collapse of the European Union, and then flight of money into America driving up the Dow Jones index to double or triple the level it is now. So he really, really recommends choice investments in the uh, in the Dow Jones and so on, which he recommends, um, driven by the flight capital coming into the Dow Jones index, into these American stock markets, Nasdaq and so on. And... Um, and then there'll be a crisis in America as the debt crisis hits America. And then it's time to get out and go somewhere else. And he's recommending where to go. He also recommends quite elaborate what's called ETFs, inverse ETFs. The stock exchange has now become so elaborate that you can bet against the flow of investments. So if investments were to drop in value, you can bet against that. It must call it an inverse. So an inverse means that you could do a 3x inverse, which is that if investments in, say, industries and metals were to decrease by 10% and you were to place a bet on that, then a 3x bet inverse would be you could gain three times the drop of 10%. You could gain 30%. And if you can understand ETFs and how they work, then he says you can actually make a lot of money. And he explains it in his website how to do it. Very interesting. But beyond that, even in the crisis, there are some investments which actually do well and some which do terribly badly. And choice companies usually do, 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 do well, no matter what the crisis, because they're well, they're well financed, they haven't extended their debts, they've got good management schemes, they pay their shareholders correctly, they're not based upon Ponzi schemes and so on. If you can find out what those are and invest properly, he thinks there's very good gains to be made. So, okay. Well, I, I see here thinking what should Britain do in our situation now, you know, trying to 
trying to, to get out of the European Union and go, go it alone or, or well, trade with the world, whatever, you know. What, what advice, I wonder, would he give us? It doesn't look as if it we're going to be any good if we stay in, in Europe, it's going to collapse. But then if other places are going to collapse as well, I mean, what? He's giving, a, he's giving an analysis. I, 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 I would find it very difficult to actually say what a particular country should do. Um, I don't think that's quite m m my remit and would require another lecture. But I mean, the way I would see, just try to understand what's happening, is that the European Union uh, has been a grand project for 30 years now, um, and certainly since the Maastricht Treaty in the early 2000, 2005, 4, 1. Um, the, um, this grand project uh, structurally has reached the end of its of this particular cycle and might might break up. Um, as that project begins to fail, its distributional arrangements, its lending arrangements, countries which are not going to make it, which have joined the European Union, requiring indefinite subsidies, um, etc. As the distributional arrangements fail and as the core economy of Europe begins to falter, as Germany has, economically and politically, then the project that was the European Union and that held all 28 countries together begins to falter and various parts of that union then want to break away like Britain, like Catalonia, like Poland and the movements to the right and to the left begin and you get these extreme movements break out which have lain below the surface of the great liberal social democratic project that is the European Union. However, I believe the European Union is just structurally set up in, in a way from the very beginning that it can't, f it, ca it can't work. Unlike the American Union, which is set up in a way which it can work. Mm -hmm. The great comparison for me is, is America Union and they, their war, civil war, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. said to the southern countries, no, you can't secede. And if you're going to try and secede and have your slavery, we're, we're going to go to war. And they had the worst war of the 19th century to, to maintain their union. So Europe hasn't, and Europe hasn't got these structural arrangements that can, I mean, uh, uh, and more, more information would require probably 15 minutes to explain it, but it doesn't have that. And therefore, when the crisis hits Europe, it's ill-equipped Ill to deal with the crisis, and then you get these manifestations of the crisis on top. So Britain leaving the European Union, Poland about to maybe leave or disobey the European Union, Catalonia uh, doing its thing, and so on, are just manifestations at the top of a vast discontent which is growing in the European Union, underneath which you have to analyse what's really happened in the structure of that system, which is not holding it together. In other words, the project that was the European Union is faltering, and therefore these are manifestations of the crisis. What should Britain do? I think we'll have to leave that to another time, obviously. It's a, bit, it's a big question. Well, we might discuss it over the meal. It's, a, it's, it's vital for Britain, for the rest of the world it's, it's something else. <laughs> <laughs> the Catalonians don't think it is. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. You keep talking about money. It's as if, as if the, the, the final collapse is because money is of no use to you anymore. Ecology? War? So what we have to, surely what, that's the, that's, that's the trauma. You have to face. There's an economic... Uh, from my point of view, there is no booze, there is no left. And you're hungry. So it's a world without money. It's, 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 it's quite something. A world, a world with, e with a serious economic crisis mm -hmm. is a very serious thing, yeah. But it's possible. Of course. And we, we, know, from our, and we know from our study of, 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 of Toynbee and other historians that there can be collapses of civilization. And that we, have to, we have to look at these things as possibilities. So when we talk about the decline of the European Union, it's not just a technical issue. It could be the collapse on a big, far bigger scale. These things have happened. There have been dark ages, yes. Uh, there have been interacting systems of crisis for understanding the collapse of civilization, which generally include a wider range of things. Like he, he, these are just some suggestions from Vice. But if we looked at Lester Brown, you have these collapsing food supplies and water, water tables around the world, and you have um, a food crisis in, in, in the world and growing populations which also have to be fed into this equation of the, of, of the current revolving crisis. The good news 
is that there are people there who could say there are potential answers if only we could get our act together. Now I believe that getting the act together is a political act. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, be I, I believe that. I, don't, I personally don't believe it's just a question of more thousands of individuals reading about the new metaphysics and, and changing their attitude and worshipping the great mother and uh, you know it's very nice, that, yeah it's great to do that kind of thing and it does make you a better human being but it's not going to solve the world crisis. It, 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 you, you continually, I hate to sound like an Edo fix, but you're continually describing in, from one frame or another the addictive cycle. And at the end of the end of the day, Very you much have so. to stop using. That's <laughs> it. End of the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, you know, it, it, you kind of pointed to it in the economic frame. It's not, you know, it's not that you have to give up economics. It's not that you have to give up money. You just have to run your business appropriately. Prudent. Yeah. Prudently. Yes, I agree. Fantastic, Jason. Uh, uh, J Jason's an expert on addiction, and I agree with everything he says. We're an addicted economy. We're addicted to lots of things, and that is uh, psychologically a very useful way of looking at the whole process. Um, we have a break. Uh, in the break, we have a 20, 25-minute video, and after the break, we have the new, new, me new metaphysics that's emerging in a bit more detail, and we have a view of the integrated human being which has now become possible uh, for the West. But um, that's something the East knew about for a long time. <laughs> um, so we, we, we move straight to the video. Incidentally, the, the, after the end of the meeting, there will be a, a, a chance to give a few testimonials in which you can say a few things about th what the course has meant to you. And that will be done in the next room in the library. And Eduardo, has, as who suggested this, um, is going to do them, and they're going to be just be you know, one minute or two minute testimonial in front of the camera. It might be useful um, if you if you if you wish to do one. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, two minute break, um, and then five minute break, and then we move into the video. Something else outside of ourselves, and seems to receive information or uh, to be attuned to something greater. Um, and the collective unconscious. Uh, let me just give you one example of that quickly. And uh, what is this attunement process and this cosmic attunement process? As I was struggling with the um, the, uh, the idea of joining these seminars with Groff and Tanas, I think I told those of you who came to the Charter experience that I had a dream. Um, and the dream was that I was trapped in a room with a malevolent spirit who was preventing me from getting out. And I, uh, this, this malevolent spirit was was, was frightening me, terrifying me, and I realised I had to get my jumper off in order to free myself so that I could fight this creature. Um, but as I took my jumper off, it's like a very tight jumper, you, you know, you get trapped in it. And I got trapped in it, and then I became even more terrified as I got trapped in the system, and I thought this malevolent spirit would destroy me. I managed to get the jumper off, and I decided I had to attack this malevolence. It was like a, it was like a hyena, interestingly enough. And, um, the, and I leapt on it and took a chunk out of its right cheek and bit it out like an animal. And at that, that it sort of backed into the corner of the room and cowered. And, and I thought, oh, I've got it. And, and then, as I was in this kind of tense situation, but thinking I might escape, I looked to my right and I saw Richard Tarnas. And my one association with him, I had many, but one that came up immediately next morning was astrologer. I am not astrology friendly. But I, I know a lot of people who are, but I'm not by nature. But this decided me to enter into this course, including the astrological part of it uh, and the dream. I thought to myself next morning, if that is something that's that serious in me, then, and it could be a, like a repetition of a birth process of being trapped, remember? And being a malevolent spirit, as many people experience in their birth processes, that they archetypally projected into a creature which is attacking them. Then, it's worth my while exploring this. That's why I entered the course. Three days later, I had another dream. And here was the dream connected to what we're saying. The dream was that I was ushered into a room and there was a, a nurse and uh, two nurses and another woman. And on this table, a bit like this table here, there were two modular systems of DNA, which are about two feet long and all full of these nodules coming off them. One was quite large and one was quite medium sized. And I knew, as soon as I saw them, that these were my children, these two. 
one of the nurse pick, started picking one up and I thought that was a bit rough. And I, I said, you've got to be more gentle with it. This, this is a very delicate thing, uh, uh, creatures or my, my children. And, um, and then another nurse picked up the first one and wrapped it in a towel like a child and handed it to me. This modular DNA child of mine. So I held it and I thought, this is my child. And I knew it to be a male child. Beautiful experience. I passed it back. Then picked up the second larger modular system and handed it to me and it was very heavy. And I knew it to be a female child. And I put this modular system over my left shoulder, like I used to do with my children when they were very small. Particularly my first child, he used to very like when we were going for walks, just going over my shoulder and sleeping. There used to be a sleeping movement and jogging around. So I put it, this modular system over my shoulder, like a baby. And, and then at that moment, I became aware that this modular system, my child, my female child, was transmitting to the cosmos and receiving information at a, in some vast system of interchange. And that I knew that I could receive it in my heart. My heart, at that moment, leapt and started pounding in response. And then took the child off, handed it back and put it back. And that was the end of the dream. Now, among many things about this dream, so the first one just giving you a hint of like maybe a birth process, maybe entrapment. Yes, I, I, I do struggle against entrapment and so on all my life, and I will take radical measures to become untrapped and so on. Um, and I do look for spiritual um, dimensions to it, uh, not astrological, but who knows <laughs> what might happen. Um, and I, I am look, I'm willing to look in new pastures, so to speak, uh, for spiritual vision that can help me with this whole idea of entrapment and yes, imprisonment, entrapment and darkness have been a big thing of the quest, haven't they? And Leonora and Fidelio and Gnostics and so on. Yeah, this is a big thing with me. This may go back to my birth, you see. So all that began to sort of make some kind of sense. And this second one began to make sense in terms of, and I mean, I don't say it in the sense of it being terribly special because I, I know hundreds of people have given me dreams which are just phenomenally like that. And, 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 and even more astounding. So this is like a common thing in the human species. So here we have something which is connected to the cosmos. It's transmitting. It's a transmitter. Part of our psyche is transmitting and receiving vast amounts of transpersonal, we call it now, information, which can help us in our creativity and our growth and our natural healing because we're connected in at that level through nature to the whole cosmos. So, continued growth of Eastern practices, point number four, in the open competition of religions for the soul. P yes, religions have declined, but let's not forget it's been open competition. Religion did destroy, try and destroy science and try and torture Galileo and, and a lot of other people and burn them at the stake. But to the best of my knowledge, science hasn't done that to people in religion, has it? It's open competition idea system, isn't it? And if Darwin has triumphed temporarily or for a long time, then that's an open system of ideas, is it not? No one's persecuting you for having other ideas. You know, a great deal anyway. Generally speaking, if you want to set up a religious system based upon a worship of Isis and, and, and an Egyptian cult, you can, can't you? No one's going to come knock on your door and say, come, come, come to prison and we're going to torture you. It's an open competition system, is it not? This is what Popper called the open society. It's about freedom and about competition, including the competition of ideas and including the competition of religious and spiritual ideas. Is that not so? <laughs> yes. Um, so, in this competition, which has now become global and via the internet and so on, the Eastern practices, of course, have been assimilated. And although Jung was one of, you know, said that we shouldn't really adopt him in the Eastern practices, we're not really made for it because we're Westerners, the people have voted with their souls and have voted for it, haven't they, by and large. And Eastern practices have grown in strength. Why? Because they work. Why? Because meditation techniques, yoga techniques, and the vast information and uh, traditions of the East are extremely valuable and have given, given succor to the soul. The Secret of the Golden Flower was one of our things, not just the Shatter experience, but secret uh, about, about 
the reason why I chose it was because it corresponded to a process that I learned in psychotherapy and also from the secret of the golden flower and applied it in psychotherapy and it's to do with the circulation of the light. Everybody recognizes we have darkness inside of ourselves, the shadow. How many of us recognize we also have the light? A real light, not real, sorry, so I'll go into that. A, a fundamental primal light inside of us which can circulate and can help us in our connection to the cosmos, our connection to a, a God, our connection to a universal intelligence, and that can promote healing and growth and give us wisdom and instruction and help. What Jung called the self. That this is a light, and that the secret of the golden flower, more than any other text and cult or religious uh, group that I've met, have made this central to their process, this circulation process, and understand the inner dynamics of the soul and how it works in its healing process. And that's why I chose The Secret of the Golden Flower. Because it, it goes over this in a very poetic manner, but it's very instructive. If anybody wants to interrupt and say something, that's fine at this point. I know there's a lot of very provocative, fast-flowing ideas. As part of the Groff interview, uh, the next one, uh, the Groff video, um, Tarnas gave a group of um, slides, which I've copied here, um, which try and present diagrammatically the transition into the modern world and what has happened to the self or the soul. That in the primal worldview he suggests that we have the self which is relatively open to the greater intelligence of the whole, the whole world and the whole cosmos. Intelligence in the soul is shaded and that shading spreads from outside to inside and the self is relatively porous. The soul is porous and open in primal systems to nature and to rebirth and to the universe. In the modern worldview he suggests that the intelligence and purpose have been confined to just within the human beings. The world is not ensouled, the universe is not anima and anima mundi. The self has just become the sole centre and the surrounding world has become dead. Uh, you might say maybe some of the great religions have done this and have said that only the human being is a soul and the rest of the world is dead. In the primal worldview, the transition into the modern worldview, the human self has been radically differentiated from the world. It has a strong boundary around it and there is me and there is the world outside and I can analyse it and try and master and control it. But in the primal worldview, you are part of and the outside world filters in and yourself, parts of you, filter out in a participation mystique, to use that word again, that phrase. He says, the ground of meaning and purposeful intelligence has been relocated from the now disenchanted cosmos, disenchanted, to an empowered autonomous self, the human empowered self. In the Western religious worldview, that emerged in the primal and modern, forming a link between them, the human self bears a unique relationship to a transcendent divinity. So, for example, in the Christian worldview, there is a transcendent divine. It's no longer in the world. The world has been created from the transcendent, but essentially is under the control of the self. And the self is linked to an off-planet, so to speak, transcendent divine. In other words, the divine is no longer in the world or in nature, like in shamanistic cultures or great mother cultures. Nature is no longer alive and no longer mysterious or numinous or spiritual. And in the late post-Copernican, post-Nishtian cosmos, where we are now, post-Copernicus, post-14th, 15th century, and post-Nishtian, post-19th century, the God is dead, the human self exists as an inf infinitesimal and peripheral island of small meaning and spiritual aspiration in a vast and purposeless universe, signifying nothing except what the human self creates in it. That was quite useful, diagrams. Is there another one? Or? Uh, let me see. Not yet. No. Um, but the other one will have to be a... Well, what would you say it could be? Would be that the self, if you imagine the 
and that self in the crown of world view. The self expands and is bigger than the world. The world is inside the self. There is inside the world what we might call the small self, which some call illusory, but is as real as the rest of the world. But it's all the self, the self. So we, we need to swap the words around, the yes. world and self. Yes, yes. And to me, that is the reality. So Atman is Brahman. So the world is only some, is it's only Brahman. It's only this it's vast. Only Although you don't have to go with it being an illusion, it doesn't mean there isn't a world. Mm. But it is, it's all there. Mm. It's just that it's not there in this yeah. paradoxical situation. Yeah. And that there are better ways Yes. Um, I think m many people will be satisfied if we return to something resembling this and a new spiral development, as it were, with the self re reopened to the world, uh, an enchanted cosmos. But yes, I mean, I think... Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Not the same thing <laughs> at all. Because the okay. self, the self um, paradoxically, is at once contains the world and all this dynamism and everything we see, and it is at once entirely silent and unmoving and does nothing, never, does nothing, never has, never will, never could. So it, unless you change the diagram, Entirely, I don't know how we contain. Yes, I mean, I suppose on another level, yes, you spiral out, so the small self spirals out until it contains the world and then knows itself to be Atman, the self, or no, to be the Brahman. But do you think in those fractal kaleidoscope images that we looked at earlier on, do you think that's what, uh, what they're getting at? that there can be some system at the, s at the centre which can grow into the to totality and vice versa. Some interpenetrative relationship between centre and, and circumference. The experience from the level of the small self. The experience from the, from the big self is that nothing ever grows, nothing ever went. We, there was never a time when you weren't the self. Yeah. You know, there was never a bit where you weren't the self and ended by some process you became the self. Yes. You were always the self. What else is there to be? Except you when you thought you weren't. You thought you weren't. <laughs> yes. But then you can think all sorts of funny things. Yes. That mean it's true. I mean, Blake, uh, Blake to, 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 in corroboration of what you're saying, Blake said that God is a circle whose circumference is everywhere and, and who, no, whose centre is everywhere and the circumference is nowhere. Well, there's a black hole and it's also the mystery. So we could have some suggestions, please, by email and, 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 uh, and, and attachments, <laughs> which you could draw some diagrams um, for us to <laughs> contemplate. Um, okay. Um, so a creation myth is, uh, is in formation, I would suggest. Uh, 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 we're talking about, I think, essentially old wine in new bottles, to use an unbearing phrase. Old wine in new bottles. We need new bottles. We need new, a new container framework for the old wine, for the old wisdom to, 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 to come alive in and be interpreted to us. Many people can't bear, for example, nowadays, some part of Christian doctrine. But having been someone who's brought up in Catholic doctrine and who reacted against it and went his own way, I mean, I can re listen to some of the prayers and, uh, and that I was brought up with. And if I just give them a different context, they can seem like you know, old wine and new bottles. I mean, one, 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 if I took out the patriarchal element of it, which has become very unfashionable, but I took one of the simplest of prayers that I was brought up with was, Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, worlds without end. Amen. It's extraordinary, you know, it comes from the Middle Ages, but the, uh, if, if you took out the patriarchal elements and the Trinity and substituted Atman and Brahman, which is more, you know, far more acceptable to us nowadays and uh, something else, then what we have is an image of, the, of some unity with the divinity across infinite time. So uh, the world's religions are scattered with these things. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you briefly one dream I had two nights ago, um, which preceded this, as I was wrestling with these ideas. I woke up in the morning and realised that I'd had the dream, which is about somebody saying to me, a woman, she was saying to me, um, the, the seeds in the desert have lain there for thousands of years. And I understood by what she was saying 
that, of course, they in season of the desert can once they have rain, they can grow again, can't they? Mm. Even even in deserts, after thousands of years, seeds can survive. The DNA survives. Okay, seeds in the desert, and I understood within the dream, not afterwards, that this applied to the quest and what I was struggling with, in not struggling with, but try, try, trying to give some form to, um, in terms of you know ancient wisdom and, and new bottles, and that that this was not just about physical seeds, but it was about spiritual seeds, uh, sower and the seed, um, the seeds which have been sown into humanity in all the ancient religions, and that we can recuperate the best of those. And that I understood within the dream that some of those seeds would grow, like in the parable of the seed, sow and the seed, some would grow, and some wouldn't grow. We can, as it were, f the ones that are suitable for the modern age and our, our modern crisis will be the ones that, 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 that will flower in this desert, this desert of the modern soul, of, of this tiny self and this, big, you know, and this search for this meaning that you just described. That some will be, and some of those will be in the East, a lot will be in the, come from the East, and some will come from the world's great traditions. A creation myth is in formation. Greatly inspired in the modern age, it needs some fuel. Where does the fuel come from? It comes actually some of it comes from evolution and physics. Aurobindo, the great mystic, uh, Hindu mystic, in the early 20th century, I was one of the first to incorporate, like Teilhard de Chardin, a theory of evolution into divine manifestation into the world. That it happened through evolution rather than an act of creation. And physics, of course, has been as we've already explored has been a great inspiration, hasn't it? Matter, life, consciousness have evolved and God also is manifest and imminent in evolution. There is a vast intelligence that saturates the void. The void is really, a, well, what we now understand, the void, the vast void, cosmic void, is a planum, isn't it? Planum means full in Latin, the fullness. It's a vast fullness, in fact. The life system, the human body and consciousness are inherent in this vast intelligence. The cosmos has a soul. We are part of that soul. It's not a part of us, we are part of it. The quantum field underlies matter and energy, as explained by physics, and also somehow it underlies the life system yet to be explained how it does that. Although chemistry, at the border of its discipline, is, in its analysis of enzymes and, and life system, coming across more and more, you find these references to the quantum field underlying uh, chemical analysis, like in enzymes, for example, which are essential to the DNA process. It's coming up in neurobiology as well. It's coming from neurobiology, and it's coming from YouTube as well. <laughs> That's where I get my information. <laughs> Um, there is an implicit and an explicit order. So uh, David Berm, the implicit order, uh, the explicit order is the phenomenal world and matter and, and what we see around us and the forces of nature and physics and chemistry and so on. But underneath that, there's a vast implicit, impl implicate order, as he calls it, implicate and explicate, which underlies it. This is the eternal philosophy called the perennial philosophy that there's a vast underlying intelligence and meaning underneath our phenomenal world. In this emerging metaphysics, we have a number of things that come up constantly that are always mentioned. For example, there's a number of incredibly fine-tuned constants have made the universe possible. They're so extraordinarily fine-tuned that it's difficult to believe that they're incidental, or coincidental or accidental. I'll give you the right word now. The universe is designed for life and consciousness, as if it knew we were coming. Our psyche is designed to attune to a universal intelligence, as attested in many people's dreams and visions and so on. I've just told you one. We are not separate, but a meaningful part of this vast intelligence. Some talk of co-creation. Human consciousness is a constructed reality and is surrounded by a vast, multidimensional field. The space-time causality coordinates, space, three dimension, time, causality, another dimension, as realized by Kant, 
our a priori categories, which what you meant, they're categories of our consciousness. They're not real descriptions of the world. They're descriptions of how our consciousness must approach the world and extract a living from it. They're not some ultimate reality, as Kant explained in the 1700s. The hologram is a metaphor increasingly used to describe the appearance of the universe out of another order entirely, some other order of dimension on the, as it were, the cosmological horizon can produce the events that we know and the processes in the explicit world. Human consciousness has separated off from the greater self. We know this from all the world's great religions and we know it also from young conscious and the unconscious. We know it from the secret of the golden flower. This is part of the perennial philosophy, is it not? That our consciousness is separated off from the greater self and thinks it knows what's happening. McGilchrist has also given a, another vast metaphor for the right hand side, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, which also feeds this information into us that really we're part of a far greater whole and it's part of us, it's actually part of our brains. Our consciousness consists of different dimensions, instinctual obviously, unconscious, conscious and higher consciousness as previously indicated, transpersonal. We have a purpose in relationship to the universe, to develop our consciousness, nowadays respect our planet, we've become aware of that, and unite with the cosmos and nature. The universe seeks to be fulfilled through us. That is our meaning. It, it wants to fulfill it through us. We are, as it were, the pilgrim on the quest to allow this seeds to grow through us. We are in the transpersonal realm at the beginning and the end. Like Groff at the beginning, at the end, we can talk about for example, religions and young and so on. Uh, in the middle, we are a conscious separated state of our egos. In this emerging physics, the gods, we realise, are projections of our own selves. The planum, this vast intelligence that saturates the universe, is personally invested in every individual. We're not insignificant. Everyone is personally invested in. Just as every great religion has told us, and the Christians told us, that God is invested in us, in our soul and in our everything we do. We're dominated by, of course, in all these myths of the myth of separation and return, that we have been separated from and we long to return to this greater unity. And talking more practically, communities, their economies and social structures require new vision for their survival and we need new language. I mean, Jason just gave one about the addiction language, that you know, we, need, we need new ways of getting into our understanding of what has separated us off and dominates the human psyche. We are meant to love, be attached and integrate with others to come alive in a fully embodied reality. Family systems in particular are our biological foundation and are being very severely threatened in the 21st century. This integration stretches to the animal kingdom, integration with all of creation, all of animals, all of life and the earth. A deep ecology becomes part of this new vision. We have so many parts of the elephant that we're uniting together for a new vision and we are meant to integrate ourselves and this is implied this has an implied ethical system in this new vision. It's not just about cosmology and about wow isn't, isn't the universe, uh, the black hole something all amazing man and uh, yeah it's, it's, it's all mind-blowing. It's not just about that. It's about a completely integrated system, uh, realizing the elephant as so to speak, the greater self being integrated into a new system which even includes ethics that I believe the emerging metaphysics has an implied ethics, which, we'll f which we can find in Carl Jung, for example, which we'll look at in a moment, finally. Um, this was taken from, you can't see this very well, unfortunately, but it's basically taken from Washburn, who has written this book, which I recommended you. Um, maybe you haven't read it, but maybe you can, which is The Ego and the Dynamic Ground. Um, although he's not a psychotherapist, you'd never guess that. He has such a grasp of the depths of the psyche. Um, he, he, he describes some process from pre-birth, womb and the universe, a la Groff, and the great mother in the early period, and the stages of the ego's situation as it becomes disembodied and represses the primal ground by which we're connected to nature and to others and part of the world and the cosmos. 
and we disconnect from that transpersonal realm and even that emotional realm increasingly we disconnect from as we go through childhood, latency, adolescence, adulthood. Those of you who've had children will know that a child can hit adolescence and turn into a radically different person and d repress everything that the parents knew in that child. Well that's typical of the growth process of many human beings, is that they repress and disconnect from the, the ground from which they're from. And then hopefully later, through traumatic experience, can recover themselves and rediscover the greater whole and undergo a conversion experience. Midlife crisis, so well described by Jung, and then beautifully described by Washburn, regeneration in spirit and finally integration. Regeneration in spirit being the um, uh, as it were, after the dark night of the soul in the midlife crisis, that there's an attempt by people typically in their 50s and 60s by which they attempt to recover their soul and the meaning of the world. I guess that's why we're all here, um, because this recovery process is a re-enchantment of the cosmos and a re-enchantment of ourselves and a rediscovery of ourselves in the spirit. And finally, the integration procedure, which happens in the last stage of life, this is a chronology which you don't have to take literally, it can, it can change and so on. But in the integration experience as being some final experience in which the ego is then, after having been long thought it was dominant, returns as to be subordinate to the ground. The, 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 the master, the emissary, the ego, and analytic intelligence, the modern worldview, scientific method, our separated egos and our... Uh, personality is so invested in power and division and control and so on, return to the ground, return to the greater source of things and become integrated within it. And Jung, who I end this whole three-year cycle on because I can't think of a better person to end it with, um, uh, gives us a, an individuation process which has been simply described, oversimplification, as a stadial process where you look at your persona, how you present yourself to the world. You look at your shadow, which is essential to all psychological growth. You integrate your animus and anima, the different parts of yourself, the uh, contrasexual parts, the female and the male, and the male and the female. And then the individuation process and the discovery of the numinous and the greater spirit of things. And in, 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 in this individual growth process, which is organically programmed within you to happen just as you're meant to grow into a into a, a human being with certain hair color and eyes and height and body size and so on so too your spirit and your personality is destined to grow this is not speculation this is not idle theory it's you find it so much in people's dreams there's mountains of evidence for this organic even unconscious shift in human beings to repair ourselves to grow to integrate all parts of ourselves in our split-off nature and our divided nature and create a genuine whole, I was going to say elephant, <laughs> whole self. And finally, um, the, I, I don't quite want to end on the West and the Western's contribution because so much of this has been said in the East, hasn't it? And that this picture, which I've shown you so often, but which shows, uh, just to remind you once again, the nature of the cosmos, the flames of the cosmos flaming out to the edge of our consciousness and the edge of the cosmos, the right hand and left hand showing the drum bringing things into existence, the fire which destroys everything, the poise of the dancer and the acceptance and grace standing on top of the, gi the small giant, the ego, um, which has to be replaced by this greater vision of an integrated unity between ourselves and the cosmos and in ourselves all the different parts of ourselves as well as our community this is what we strive for in the integration process but it can only happen if the ego and all its machinations and all its illusions is subordinate to the greater self so that ends our three-year cycle <laughs> Would anyone like to make any statements or about, about ask any questions about this before we end? Um, Alan, I can't help but mention being sharp because... Yes, do. It, um, and what brought it out was when you were talking about various different religions way back, that's the 
one thing that I found when I went there, that it was the, the Christianity part of it was only, only part of it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it went back right through, and, and the architecture of the place goes back through Islam, Sufi, everything is there. And it was a great I, um, revealing moment for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend anybody to go. Mm -hmm. The fact that there was the other thing, part of it, that led, led, led us on to Sacred Job. I found myself at a conference with you and then Rosemary was there and uh, you, Alan. Yes. There was a wonderful German chap giving a lecture. I can't remember his name. He was, he was relating um, the, the stars and the cosmos and how everything related to each other, all to, to uh, mathematics. And somebody from the audience asked a question. They said, well, you know, you said that there's the 25-year cycle of the moon and all the rest of it. It doesn't quite coincide with challenging you. And he came up, he used this expression, almost exactly. He said, well, it's almost exactly. And that was a huge relief to me. I realized that in, imperfection is part of it. And if we struggle all the time to perfect we look at all these things we're looking for in the cosmos and everywhere, we won't find it. Because it's, the, uh, it's our imperfections that endear ourselves. It, we're, well, what endears me to other people is their imperfections. Uh, and it seems to me that without imperfections, there's no life. Yeah. Because the, if, if once you get to a perfect situation, death. Yes, I remember that moment. Yes, I was there. Yes, it was remarkable. Thank you, Christopher. Anybody else? It shocked that it was a really special experience for me, and, and I haven't quite, I'm still trying to process w what it was, but it was very significant. And there's something about the building and the creative communities that have, cre that have, have been there and made, made it happen over the years. And that energy behind that, that was really felt. And how, um, and how the arts and science actually came together and mingled. Because that was my question. You to be, gave the question was how, how, how the arts and science can somehow just come together mm. and uh, in yeah. some communion. And, uh, and I felt that very strongly there in, in, in the cathedral. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was a very special uh, experience. Thank you for making it happen. Yeah. Okay, to repeat, we'll, um, we'll be going through another 100 days. If anybody wants to join us in these marathons, um, we're going to have a, a potential revisit to Chartres. We're going to have a debriefing session probably before Easter um, in which we can try and integrate the, the material from the three years. Um, we have a preparation period in which some of you may wish to continue with the quest starting in September. Um, it'll be, I anticipate, quite renewed throughout um, because of the reasons I gave earlier on. Um, we have a meal at six o'clock. Before that, um, there's some testimonials. If anyone would like to, gi to give them, they'll be in the library next door where the uh, Eduardo will be taking the, um, the camera. Um, there's some books for sale here if anybody wants them at discount. And we have a, anything else and a wonderful experience. But isn't that evidence of the process that you're describing? That it's, um, well, in mine and Bones' language, yeah. it's dialogic. And it's dialogic between, I would see our perspective yes. rather than a self yes. and, and the whole. And it's a, the word you use was co creative, I would say. It's a co creative process that yep. generates its own life. Yes, indeed. Indeed, yes, very much so. OK, thank you very much. We have the uh, it's five past five. We've ended quite well, actually, considering the amount of material we've gone through. Um, we intend to have a meditation, um, which would be wonderful to end this process on. There's also... <laughs>